it's funny how two different things can often get connected with history, right? Like the gold standard in the 1970s for most people is also connected to Nixon. Nixon in the gold standard because Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. Or you could think of interest rates at the end of the 70s and you could connect that with Paul Volcker. So those two names, if you know anything about interest rates in the 70s, you know those two names go together. If you study stock market history, 1987 and Black Monday <laughs> go together where the stock market fell 23% in one day. That's 23% in one day. And then we could just keep going on. And one of the ones that sticks out to me is real estate in 2006, 2007, and how that was connected to credit default swaps and packaging mortgages and liar loans and how that kind of got all connected together. And in fact, maybe people could even connect real estate and Lehman Brothers together. So I find it funny how different assets or different entities, whether they're presidents or policies and commodities or stocks or markets, can often get linked together. And there's a linking that's going on right now that has a very good chance of bringing a lot of volatility to people's stock portfolios all over the world. And it's that current connection that I want to talk about. Hey everybody, this is RC Peck and this is my weekend podcast. And the theme for this weekend, I will just call um, oil debt with a very beautiful stylized image here with the word debt on the side of a 50 gallon barrel of oil. And it's the combination of specifically energy debt, a half a trillion dollars worth, and oil in this case. So it could be different types of energy, but in this case it's oil. And it's how these two have come kind, kind of to be uh, bedfellows that is really creating a lot of havoc in the market this year. So with that, let me show you what I see here. So the first thing I want to show you is a price chart of West Texas Intermediate Crude, WTIC oil. Basically, it's U.S. oil. And if you look at the screen here, you see two horizontal green lines. That represents a channel. And at the end of 2008 and the first two months, or probably let's call it two and a half months of 2009, oil was bouncing between $50 a barrel to $35 a barrel. So it was in a $15 range, bouncing up and down very volatilely um, and violently between $35 and $50. And it was bouncing, and it, it, I mean, it had fallen tremendously, $144 a barrel down to a low of 34 and change a barrel. But it was really the bouncing and the bottoming around of oil between December of 2008 and let's call it mid-March of 2009, which right around the same time, March 6th, the stock market bottomed. I think that's probably more of a coincidence than anything else. But oil bottomed, went from $144 a barrel, bottomed at 34, and just bounced around between, let's call it 35 and 50. Okay, now fast forward to today. The two lines you see, it, this is still West Texas Intermediate Crude, still oil. The two lines you see is still the $50 line and the $35 line. And if you look at the screen here of oil, now just let me just tell you that this, the, the blue smoothed outline is a 70-day exponential moving average. And then there's open, high, low, close, red and green lines is the open, high, low, close of oil on a daily basis. But what you can see is it's kind of bouncing off this 50. If you, if you look here, bounces off 50, bounces off 50, bounces off 50, bounces off 50, gets under 50, and then, then that, that support has now become a ceiling and it can't get above 50, and now it just almost dropped right down to 35. It's so close right to 35. Maybe it's even at um, 35. So what we have is that 2008, 2009, $50 to $35 channel again. It'll be interesting to see, and I think it's important to the world economy. Um, well, it's not important to the world economy, but if oil continues to fall below 35 and gets into the 20s, that's telling you something's really wrong with the world economy. That 
there's just not much need for oil. And I get uh, the fracking and horizontal drilling and how that technology has changed a tremendous amount of oil that gets produced in the U.S., but it doesn't fully recognize and explain why oil would continue falling. So if oil, in fact, does fall below this channel, I'm not, not saying it will or it won't, but if it does, then that's telling you a lot that something's really off with the world economy. The other thing, if oil does fall below the 35, this is kind of this 35 to $50 channel, that's going to absolutely create havoc on junk bonds or low-grade corporate bonds, which I'm going to show you in a second because in this case, it's that cheap debt, that low-grade corporate bond debt in energy companies and oil that's kind of the, the new Nixon gold like in the 70s, but now it's the oil and that junk debt for 2015. And they're linked. They're connected together. As one falls, the other falls. And really, junk bonds are falling alongside oil. And as oil continues to fall, if it does, that's going to create a lot of problems with junk bonds. Now, if oil recovers, then junk bonds recover. So the story is oil and the way it's connected to you and me and our portfolios is through junk bonds. Because if the bond market, if junk bonds start defaulting, that's going to create a lot of havoc and waves of problems through the entire bond market, which will move very quickly into the stock market. Now, here is a price chart, and I have to describe this price chart a little bit to you because it's not the clearest price chart I've ever shown you. On the screen, you see a red line and a blue line. Now, the red line and the blue line, they both represent junk bonds. They both represent junk bonds. One of them, the red one, is showing you the price chart of junk bonds with dividends, if you count dividends part of the price. So if it's getting 5 or 10%, then that price chart of the red line, that red line goes higher because it's including the dividends. The blue line below is just the capital change of junk bonds, right? So there's no dividends included in the price chart. Now, what I want to show you is for the blue line, and they have this blue horizontal line here, junk bonds have already broken below their 2011 low if you don't um, include dividends, so just from a, from a capital price, or just from a price alone, junk bonds have already broken below their 2011 low. And that is significant. That's not a trivial thing. Now, if you include dividends and how much you've gotten paid in dividends from 2011, we still have another 20% that the actual price of junk bonds could fall. I mean, I'm looking at JNK and HYG. Those two ETFs together represent about $25 billion worth of junk bonds. Um, JNK having lower quality bonds than HYG. And specifically, um, their durations are longer in junk bonds. So if you know what a duration means in the bond industry, uh, the durations um, are more negative for the ticker symbol JNK. Uh, than HYG. And if none of that makes sense, that's actually okay because it's kind of geek speak for bonds. The point is, if you don't include dividends, junk bonds have already broken down below a major, major support. So that's not good. That's going to bring more instability into the stock market. And I'm not going to say it's a, you know, a death kneel because depending on who's looking at junk bonds and whether they're including dividends or not, we either have broken down and that's a very negative message to the stock market. But again, it's oil that's driving this right now. It's not junk bonds by itself, right? If oil rebounds to 50 and maybe settles around 55 or $60, then I see the stock market breaking to the upside. If it stays between that 35 and 50, I think there's going to be more sidewaysness to the stock market. So there's this 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 kind of this linking between junk bonds and oil that is happening right now and they are very very closely connected and that's really what I'm watching right now to determine what's going to happen with the stock market. Now, if you look at the stock market, it's been in a 14% channel or about a 275 point channel for the last 15 months. And if you look at the screen, 
the black line is the actual closing price of the S&P. The red line is the 200-day moving average, which let me just say the flatter the 200-day moving average gets, the more erratic and violent and volatile the market will be. If you ever are going to buy something with a flat or a flatter 200-day moving average, you really want to buy at the bottom and sell at the top because a flat 200-day moving average means there's no trend, there's no trend up, there's no trend down. And what we have is the S&P getting very close to, I mean, literally right now for the last two weeks, it has a flat 200-day moving average. But coming into August of this year, it was clearly going up and doing well. And with the sell-off in August and the retest of the August low in September, it brought the 200-day moving average down, and now it's getting to be flat. A flat 200-day moving average is a dangerous thing to have if you actually want direction in the market because we have a directionless market right now. And that's why we're having huge moves up and huge moves down because the market literally doesn't know what to do. On one side, you have oil falling and junk bonds falling and emerging markets falling and fracking companies falling, right? So it's it's not everything. It's, a, it's you know, one major sector, the energy sector. But then on the other hand, you have consumer discretionaries going up. You have central banks on the other side saying or intimating they will print more money. So there's literally kind of a tug of war going on, which was my theme of last week. And we're going to be in this sideways no man's land until something works itself out. Either the dollar breaks up or breaks down, which I don't have a price chart of the dollar this week, or junk bonds stop falling and find a base and stabilize. They just need to stabilize. They don't actually need to go back up. If they just stabilize, that's fine. But they're not going to stabilize until oil stabilizes. So the, the tail that's wagging the dog right now is the oil industry, specifically the actual commodity. That's what's driving things right now. And that's what's going to keep um, the S&P really in this trading range until oil finds its bottom. So what's the takeaway? What, what can you take away from this? So the first is we're just we're within extremes right now. Right? We have that sideways 14%, depending on how you measure the channel from top to bottom or from bottom to top, but we're in that 14%-ish channel that has no direction. And my suggestion is you do not make major moves until the market reveals its direction because things can get very erratic while still staying in that 14% channel. Hey guys, this is just another step in helping you protect your future, and protect your portfolio. Until next time, this is RC Peck.